enjoy. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Bex. Um, so, just a couple of things I'd like to say first. So, before I moved from London to Manchester, everybody said there's no sun in Manchester, it rains all the time. This clearly is not true, since we've had the last three weeks of sunshine, so I'm wondering why everybody was leading me astray. And secondly, uh, I have to say this is the first tech event that I've come to in a long time, where there's a much more equal balance uh, of men and women. That's absolutely fantastic, and I think the organization is to be commended in that, and it's obviously it's representative of the community itself, so I just wanted to preface my remarks by saying that. Um, so I've moved from London to work with uh, Co-op Digital, uh, largely around the business case for Federation House, which Lawrence referred to earlier, and I'm happy to talk to any of you about that and how we hope to engage with the broader technology community afterwards. Uh, but just to say, this is a talk that I have done and developed personally, it's not related to my Co-op work necessarily, and uh, <coughs> just want to make that clear at the start. So. Um, I've had a, a, a background in a number of areas in my career, so I started as an arts administrator and then I became a journalist and then I worked in government and technology has been a kind of a theme throughout that. And over the last year and a half, I mean I've, I've been an early adopter of technology and a great fan, but I've had some kind of growing concerns over the last five or six years about where are we really going in terms of technology and society. And so I started writing and blogging and doing talks about technoethics. And, and when we say, what do I mean by technoethics? What I really mean is these three things. So it's about people, and it's about privacy, and it's about profit. And I'll, I'll be covering off those three things uh, during the talk. But I want to go back to the arts for just a moment. So um, there's a mathematical equation which artists use uh, in their work. And they use it to determine the most aesthetically pleasing proportions, and it's called the golden ratio, it's sometimes referred to as the secret mathematics behind beauty. And so when you see God touching Adam's hand here, the space between their fingers is, is where the golden ratio divides. And so it's interesting to think that artists would use mathematics as part of their creative process. Interesting, but not surprising maybe. Um, so in Hackers and Painters, Paul Graham says he thinks there are great similarities between software developers and artists largely because they both want to do good things, they want to make good things. But I think that's the point where the similarities end because all of us in the room today who are involved in technology, many of you will be actually writing code, many of you will be software engineers, have the capability to impact our society in a way that Michelangelo could never have dreamed of when he painted the creation of Adam. And so Mark Anderson says, software is eating the world. And so we're all involved in creating this software, but how much time do we really spend to think about the actual impact of what we're doing? Because you're literally coding the future financial and economic well-being of your fellow man. And that's a pretty big responsibility. So I would argue that you've moved from being engineers, those of you who are, who are coding and are software developers in the room, into social engineering. Right? And social engineering hasn't historically been very good for society. right? I mean, social engineering, as we understood it historically, was done by totalitarian governments when they wanted to engineer an outcome in their citizenry that benefited them. And, you know, that was bad, but at least we had democracy. So we had the opportunity of democratic force toppling totalitarian regimes. And when I worked in government, I've worked in local government, I've worked as the director of digital projects for the mayor of London, I've worked with the cabinet office and GDS. But when I started, in London 2009, uh, you know, I was always amused when people would say, we're really concerned about the amount of data government has on us. And I'm like, well, they really don't have anything useful, right? Because it wasn't really that useful then. But of course, we know now that's changed drastically. And so through the internet and technology and mobile phones, our governments have massive troves of information on us, massive troves of information. And when you think that David Cameron, when he was asked about the Snoopers Charter, uh, he said, do we really mean to allow a means of communication between two people which we cannot read? I mean, you think about that, it's an extraordinary statement from the person who was Prime Minister of a democratic country. Do we mean to have a means of communication between two people which we cannot read? And so when a former Stasi lieutenant was asked, what did he think of the Snoopers Charter in the UK? This is what he said. You know, this would have been a dream for us. So much information on so many people. And if you go back to the definition of social engineering, what you need to do to achieve those societal outcomes that you want to engineer, you need to have a body of knowledge about the society you wish to engineer and the tools with which to do it. So let's think about Google, shall we, in that context. 
So 900 million users. And the body of information that they have about all of us is a trove. I mean, it is, it is more information about our society than we have ever seen in human history. Academics could only dream of a sample size this size. Everything you do, your demographic information, income, sex, race, marital status, geographic, psychographic, personality type, values, attitudes, interests, lifestyles, right? That's historically unprecedented. If I was an academic with a sample size that wouldn't even come close to this, my research would be bound by ethical frameworks and boundaries. What are the ethical frameworks and boundaries that are around this data that companies are using? It is completely invisible to us. And it's what the author Frank Pasquale talks about in his Black Box Society when he talks about the secret algorithms that control money and information. Let's go back to a point of totalitarianism. So when Mark Zuckerberg was asked in 2013, somebody at a conference raised some questions about privacy and data, and he said, I don't understand your question. If you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. But only dictators prefer a transparent citizenry to a free press, right? I have a right, a democratic right, to keep my secrets and to be the person who decides when, my, when, I, when I want to be more open or closed. So that's a worrying type of language. It's a worrying type of worldview. You have nothing, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. <clears throat> Hands up, who saw the last season of House of Cards? Don't want to be doing two spoilers here. So let's think about this in, in you know, art imitating life. So in the last series, you had a fictitious search engine called Polyhop, which Frank Underwood's opponent was using to get the upper hand. And you know, why it's life imitating art is because the American Institute of Behavioral Insight and Technology has done several very interesting reports which say search engine ranking influences voter preference by up to 20%. That's 20%, right? Where you rank on search engines because people equate higher ranking with trust. So if I'm the politician that's higher on the ranking, I'm getting more voter trust, I'm getting a higher voter preference. Now, why does that matter? So it matters, when I worked in local government, I had a purda period, right, where before an election I couldn't produce communication that would be seen to influence a particular party, or indeed a particular politician. And had I done that, the politician would have redress because he or she could go to the electoral commission and say, I've been disadvantaged, this is an unfair election. So if Google were to, and I'm not saying they would, tweak an algorithm to preference Hillary Clinton over Trump or vice versa, what redress would they have? What redress would any politician have? How would they even prove? So the lack of visibility of the algorithmic process is not neutral and is affecting our democracy. And I think they're serious questions that we need to answer. <coughs> if you see what I mean. Now the answer that Google gives to this is, oh well, the autocomplete tends, tends to return what people are generally searching for. So people are just going conservatives, not anything else. So you know, what's troubling about this is they don't have an answer that I can go, well, that makes sense, actually. It's not really an answer. It's just avoid it. But these are not trivial matters. So I'm going to move just to talk briefly about you know, the rise of robotics and automation and the sort of deepening inequality that we're going to have in society as robotics and automation takes jobs. You know, People used to think the robots were coming to take all the crap jobs. Right, well, it turns out they're coming to take all our jobs, okay? Um, and so we have to think about what kind of contracts, and I mean those, you know, emotional contracts and social contracts and relationships that we have with large technology companies, because I think they're going to change significantly. And so if you looked at Marx in 1891, who said, does a worker in a cotton factory produce only cotton? No, he produces capital and values which serve anew to command his work and to create by means of it new values. So let's look at Google in the age of Marx? It's a different question, isn't it? When you email, are you only corresponding? No, you're producing capital and value for Google. You're producing values which serve you to command your work. So every keystroke is making them money. Now, when we started on the digital journey, free was really good, right? Free was brilliant, because we didn't know what would emerge down the years. And then we got to the point where we're saying, oh, if we're not paying for the product, we're the product. Right? And now I'm looking into a future where I'm thinking, I have no job, 
you know, automation has taken out my job in taxation, in journalism, you know, in parts of pharmaceuticals and medicine. It isn't about taking out manual labor, right? And, and I'm just going to be a shadow digital worker for these digital companies. And everything I do, they make profit from. Now, how is that a good business model? If somebody had said to us, hey, I'll give you this, but I'll take all this, you'd have said, I don't think so. In the same way as you know, Instagram, we shared all our photographs. I'm not seeing any shares back, right? So they get a billion, whatever. Um, so I think we're going to have to look at creating new digital business models, which, which are more ethical, and they're going to provide some financial value back to their users. <clears throat> I'm a fan of life, uh, art imitating life. So, you know, it's interesting when you think, how many of you have seen the film Elysium? Okay, so Elysium tells the story of these incredibly wealthy people who no longer have to live on Earth, okay, because they can go to another planet. And, and everybody left down on, on Earth is kind of scrambling over scarce resources, right? And then you think about Elon Musk. <laughs> And you think, wow, in my lifetime, there's a real chance this guy's going to get to Mars, right? And, and you have to listen to what he says when he says, I want to die on Mars, just not on impact. Okay? And you look at how much the billions and billions that Google and Fidelity and Amazon are pumping into this space travel. You know, it's interesting, isn't it? And when you see PayPal developing intergalactic currencies since 2013, you kind of think, you know, if they're building secondary services on this and Musk hasn't even got to Mars yet, it's going to happen, right? And in 1966, the United Nations had a, our space agency had a charter which basically said, you know, space travel will be undertaken, signed up by every country in the world. Space travel must be undertaken and exploited for the benefit of all mankind. Now, do we really think that's the way it's going to work out? We're all going to get a share in the new planet, are we? I don't think so. And I introduce this because I'm really saying there's an urgency about technoethics debates because if we can't figure out the technical underpinnings of our current world, how do you think we're going to do when they all start leaving for the other planet? Right? Because what we'll see on the side of their ship when they're heading up there is this. <laughs> so I think we need to be looking at a number of different things. We need to have leadership in the technology community that says there is a better way and mean it. We need to look at new business models where, there, where we are not just taking everything for, and, and companies are taking these for vast profits and not sharing. And we need to have equitable distribution of digital dividends. So if I share my things, I am paid for them, just like I would be in any other part of a, of a financial um, ecosystem. And it's almost as if we have given technology an indulgent place where the rules don't apply. So. So, how many of you are Facebook users, right? I'm guessing nearly everybody, right? So, in order for you to have the experience you do, so you don't see pedophilia or suicides or a lot of very nasty stuff, it has to be filtered out. And it's not done by machines. It will, of course, be in the future. But right now, it's done by moderators in the Philippines, not Facebook staff, of course not. These people get a dollar an hour to do that every day with no psychological support, nothing. And like, we weren't okay with companies exporting physical waste into developing countries 20 years ago. But now we're, we're okay with exporting our psychological waste with impunity, that's okay, somehow, because it's technology, that makes it right. But Aristotle said, you know, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but it's a habit. And I think we have to start asking questions like, if we look at efficiencies, you know, technologists traditionally try to drive out efficiencies. That's what they're brilliant at. But sometimes inefficiency is good because you need that balance. So I went to Botswana a number of years ago with the uh, World Bank to do an open data audit. And uh, everywhere we went in government buildings, people had piles of papers and they were sorting out all these papers. Now, an efficient technological response would be to say, we should digitize this, right? But then you have a different world order problem, don't you? Because you don't have any jobs for those people. And in a country like Botswana, that's very important, equally as it will be here. So the question I think we need to ask as technologists and in the sector, we can do this, but should we? So in the same way, you know, I wouldn't expect a medical practitioner not to have studied ethics. Why is it that computer science does not include ethical thinking in its courses? Because really, this is where we're now at. Okay, 
And so with a lot of power comes a lot of responsibility. And I think it's time for the technology community to start asking the right questions and to start building more integrous and more ethically driven values. And that's partly why, of course, I was attracted to the co-op because you know, they have a very strong ethical value set and I think they will be part of the technology community in the north that will be you know, looking at driving the best kind of values possible. So, so that's a big responsibility, guys, and uh, that's all I wanted to say. If you want to know any of the uh, books that I use for the research for the talk, they're here. We can send you out the slides, and uh, that's me. Thank you. Any questions? Let's Hi, hello. Thanks for that. I'm actually doing my thesis on the economics of altruism, and what I wanted to ask you was, you know, it's, it's a great debate to talk about it, but we live in a capitalist society, so how do you, you know, it's not just about the way of thinking, because selfishness isn't really a trait that we humans are born with, so how do you propose that, you know, because in a way capitalism does you know, create so many other, you know, opportunities and jobs and, and money as, and profits, as you mentioned. So how do you feel that this idea can be translated into mm -hmm. businesses? Well, I think a very good model is uh, Jaron Lanier. Uh, he's written a book called uh, Who Owns the Future? And so he talks about micro-licensing content. So in so far as every keystroke we create, right, to, to whether that's any digital service, that there is an economic value that it's, is attached to that and is returned. Token, money, whatever. Um, but that's about, that's about these companies understanding that they can no longer just take that there has to be a reciprocal model in business terms. So if we're talking about the vast profits that these companies are making, you're talking about tiny amounts back to users so that you are rewarding back financially for the use of the service because the gap between you know, what we cost them, so we cost Google a dollar a gigabyte, I think, right? And in, in return for that, we signed away all our email in perpetuity like, how dumb were we? Because we didn't understand that they were going to make all this money. So that's what I see. So micro-licensing back. And would, you not, would you not think that that would almost become a totalitarian case if we were mandating what these companies were doing and we were controlling them? Like, well, we, we, we would but they have, you know, we have no democratic oversight of what they're doing, yet what they're doing is impacting our democracy, right? I don't think a private company should be in a position to do that. That's not what a democracy is about. And so what I want to have is oversight of what's happening, right? And that's, that's the point. They can't just, well, I don't believe it's a personal thing. It's a political, it's an ideological stance. Uh, and it, that depends where you fall on that personally. Um, in the same way as I think Airbnb is a fantastic success. But do I think it's right that Airbnb get to disintermediate the planning system? No, I don't, right? I have a reasonable right as a citizen to expect that if I buy a home in a residential area, I'm not going to have a turn of tourists in five houses up and down the street. Because that's what the planning authority is for, and that's for everyone. That's what a democracy is. It isn't just about winner takes all. Right? It isn't about build it out so fast, we'll beat the regulators, and by the time they try and shut us down, we'll be too big. Lawrence? So uh, one thing is we need, a, we need some kind of a, a framework for really understanding this and for, for thinking it through, and, and I'd like to suggest that the ideas of of justice, of social justice yeah. and global justice could very well be one way of, uh, of doing that. Um, my, my question is, is something slightly different. Platform cooperativism, mm -hmm. cooperativism is seen as at least one of the solutions or, or one of the potential avenues we might explore and therefore, um, given your location, um, I was wondering if that's something that the, the, the co-op is Absolutely. thinking about as one of its long-term ventures and if there's anything concrete that, that uh, you're working on. Yeah, not world. concrete at the moment, but def most definitely, and I think that was kind of flagged a bit in Lawrence's talk as well about what does a co-op look like in a digital age. But we have to, you know, we have to look at companies and the sharing economy, you know, when you look at that, it's not sharing, is it? You know, so I tell a story about visiting Uber's offices in London and uh, it was a very hot day. And I came up to the office, and there was a long queue of men, out, mostly men, out in the street in the boiling sun, right? And, and then I walk into this empty air-conditioned reception, and I go up to their beautiful air-conditioned office with all these lovely young people behind their beautiful Apple Macs, 
And you think, what's wrong with this picture? These men are commodities, that's all. They don't even deserve the respect of being given a place out of the sun. Like, you know, we have to do better than that, right? So we have to make sure that people who have no benefits, no security, who are being forced to buy nicer cars with loans from Goldman Sachs, which Uber then cut their commission, so they're like indentured slaves. Like, what's, what's wrong with people? That's not a good deal. So the whole contingent labor, gig economy, that has to be done differently so that people benefit, right? We all benefit. So drivers who are driving for those companies benefit, right? So it definitely is a huge area that we, we want to explore. But it's very early days, but for sure. Thanks. That's a long journey. <laughs> um, I was just curious to ask you, obviously it's, it's an issue that affects all of us and you've put um, a huge amount of thought into this in terms of looking at the value we provide and, and what we get in return. Um, I'm just curious to know what services you use and how you feel about using those services currently because it's not as easy just to cut the cord on, yeah, yeah. on where we're at now. We've gone past the point of, of no return really with where we're at so I just would yeah. like to understand how what services you use and how you feel about that and what you yeah. see in the future for that is for you. Yeah, like I said, I was an early adopter and really, like I, you know, Gmail came like, right, good browser, and blah, blah, blah. And it was only about a couple of years ago, um, I'll get back to more specifics, it was a small anecdote beforehand, I was, I was searching a uh, very large waterproof disposable bag. And I put it into the search engine and I thought, shit, that kind of looks like I'm going to kill my husband or something. I'm trying to bury him, right? You know, actually what I wanted was some something from my garden furniture, right, for the winter. But that's the point where I suddenly started thinking, I'm not alone here. And so you suddenly realize what was the wonderful internet, you know, which was just, like, so exciting for me. I mean, I can't describe to you how, how excited I was about the internet. Suddenly it becomes an adversary in some way, and then I'm suddenly trying to find, you know, how do I shut this down? So, you know, I use, I use Firefox, I use things like Ghostery, so I can see what blocking, you know, what third-party people are accessing my sites. But... You're right, you know, it's like 16 years in, what do you do? Um, so, so I don't, you know, I, I am a Facebook, not really a Facebook user, but I'm kind of there because I kind of have to be, right? But, yeah, it's that point of what do you do, right? And, and you have to have agency over it. So we're consumers, that's what I mean. We have a right to say to these companies, I don't want to do business like this. you got to do business better. So, yeah, just try and call them out to account, I guess, that's the best thing. <laughs> So, so is this, is this the way to move forward on this then to, to provide audience? Is this where, is this where, the, the, where um, we're talking about the ethical business models? Is that the, 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 essentially consumers vote with their feet and move away from yeah. the, the, the companies that, yeah. are, that, are, that are working this way towards alternatives that offer a, a better? But I think it's about, you know, I think it's about integrity because, you know, fundamentally what people love about technology is simplicity, right? That's the beautiful thing about technology. It makes it so simple it masks the complexity underneath. People don't even know what they're giving away. There's a wonderful little video from Fast Company where it takes people, it stops people in the street and it asks them to read out loud some of the terms and conditions in their apps. It's hilarious. People are going, what? Oh my God, really? Um, so I think, you know, technology companies have to affront it because most people, a lot of people don't understand what they're giving away, what the impact of that means, where their data is being sold, what future impacts that's going to have on their health insurance and their life insurance and all of these decisions. So technology companies don't want to be upfront with that because they know consumers are going to go, are you kidding me? That's who you're selling my data to, right? So, you know, it's an industry-wide problem. So, 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 so the, um, are we, is that the hope then, that people will vote with their feet? Because obviously the, the other alternative is, is, to, is the legislative, um, hoping that everybody sure, gets together, yeah. wakes up and, and, you know, whether that's by well, a, techno disobedience or whatever, that yeah. there's, there's some... Who knows, that right? right? Who knows? It's very hard to predict that, right? And, and especially when many politicians are way behind on digital, right? They like just don't get it, they don't understand, they're... You know, they operate in different networks. So, you know, what hope would we have that legislation is going to do this for us? Regulators, there's a great book called Play Money. I don't know if any of you have read it by Julian Dibble, who is a wired journalist. And he spent a year as an in-game currency trader. So he was like trading invisible armor and selling it on eBay for real money, 
okay? And so at the end of the year, he's earned $50,000, and he rings up the IRS and says, I want to declare my tax. And the IRS woman said, well, what's your business? And he said, well, I sell, you know, game currency. And she's going, that's not a thing. <laughs> what do you sell? And he said, invisible armor. She said, that's definitely not a thing. <laughs> it's hilarious. And she just, walked, not a clue, right? But no understanding that you can actually, the minute something's contested in a virtual space, it has an economic value. And so people will game it and sell it. So, you know, I, I do some work for Ernst & Young, and, you know, I did a talk for them, and their, their taxation people are looking at me like, she's completely mad, right? Because they, you know, they don't live in that world. So, they, so I think regulation is behind. Uh, but whether or not people will just now, uh, I mean, events like this are very important, right? You know, Bex told me earlier, 500 people, I think, subscribed up to your mailing list for Tech for Good. That's a great thing. So I don't know. But I just wanted to raise the questions. Uh, because I just got so fed up of everybody else saying how wonderful technology was, you know, and really, there's a lot of issues we need to address. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello. Um, do you have a suggested curriculum for uh, engineers on ethics? Have you got a particular favourite book or... Thing I should go and study. Ooh, I should have a think about that. Um, I mean, I studied philosophy in university uh, early on as a student uh, and did ethics. Um, but no, I, I think any any you know ethic, any courses like philosophy or ethic modules that you would take. But I'll, I'll have a think about specific ones. But uh, yeah, not not any specific questions. Last question. Sorry. Oh, there's another lady over here who wants to ask. Oh no, time time man. <laughs> So I have a confession, I tried to come off Facebook last year yeah. and uh, got told off by ants and people who stalk me on Facebook because they love seeing <laughs> the pictures of the dog or whatever yeah. they're up to. And I also missed out on some events through the gym or, yeah. or, or social stuff. So Facebook, yeah, they, they sell our data, but being devil's advocate, how are they supposed to run their business if they don't sell our data? Or so just Well, I, see, I guess the thing would be, if you look at WhatsApp, you know, it's at scale, right? Would I pay, they have like, whatever, 400 million users, right? So everybody just has to pay a dollar, right? That's a lot of dollars, okay? Would you pay for your service if they said, well... well Facebook apps are taking that now, so people pay the dollar, Facebook are going to be getting the details. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, but I, but I think this, it, this is the thing, right? So we, we, we got it for free. Uh, and they don't really surface. I mean, their their terms and conditions are longer than the American Constitution, <laughs> right? So, like, don't even bother, right? You know. So my point is, you, we have to know what contract we're entering into. Really, we have to say, I'm prepared. I mean, look, I, I've been an internet user that long. There's a virtual edition of me in Google servers, right? Like, there's no point in me going, oh, I'm all out of that now. You know what I mean? So, but I think it's about. Are they behaving ethically? Are they transparently showing us what they're doing with our data? So we make informed decisions, and we have pushback. Right? That's all I'm asking for. I'm not saying everybody get off Facebook, but you know. And to, to be fair, I don't think Mark Zuckerberg thought he was going to create a utility. He was creating a social network for friends, and the ethical, the governance, the the p policy um, knowledge is not there. He was 20 what when he created Facebook, right? So what if? flipped, you know, at 21, right, about big issues of governance and, you know, he was asked very early on in the business, he was asked by some of his founders to say, you need to tell us what the strategy is. And he went away and after three weeks he came back with one PowerPoint slide and it said, get more users. So. Go on, was there another question? <laughs> Fine. Ian had one more there. <laughs> Hello. Um, it goes back a little bit to also Wayfinder, a question there, because um, as I understand, it's an open uh, standard. And so I think open standards have a huge part to play in all of this. And I get a bit stuck now around the financing of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it strikes me that perhaps people don't go into it that with um, you know the idea of building utility, but eventually venture capitalism sort of takes over. So I'm kind of curious in your time and research, what kind of um, uh, like funding uh, models have you seen and how um, different um, economics play into this? Yeah, well, and see, the other thing is I think the funding model is kind of broken. 
So, you know, you look at, you look at people building an app, you know, somebody invests 10 million in, and then 20 million in, and they're not, it's not a paid app, and you think, what is the revenue model? What's the story? And much more, and so a lot of those big unicorn companies tend to take a lot of money in, and it's all about rushing to exit, right? So the maximum prof profitability, it doesn't really matter if the thing is working, you just drive up the IPO, you know, you take your venture capital funds and you sell. And I think the way forward, one of the ways forward is to look at building sustainable digital businesses, right, that are about employment and broader economic uh, contribution. And that's what I'd hope we would be part of in Co-op Digital in Manchester, saying not really interested in hearing about the big programmer unicorn. I want to really learn about companies that want to build, like I have a startup, it's a transport API. Like we want to build a sustainable business. It's not about the, we want to exit here and, and be millionaires, right? I'm sure that'd be lovely, but it's not where we're going. Uh, so I think there's flaws in the funding structure that attract certain behaviors. So I think it's a broader piece that we need to look at, not just how do we monetize, but how are we actually funding these things and are we, you know, are we just pumping this money in because it's a Silicon Valley type approach. Cool, thank you very much. Thank you.